Good morning, everyone, to our panelists, to our audience at large, to our second Youth Speak, discuss youth speak Leaders discussion, hosted by Servant Leader and Active Citizenship. Um, my name is Lillian Plykies, and I will be the chairperson for today's discussion. Um, before we begin, I would like to allow each panelist to introduce themselves. Deborah Kerr, would you like to start? Hi everyone, um, my name is Debrika Paulson. I am currently 19 years old and I'll be turning 20 in a few months. I am studying acting in theater and performance at the University of UCT, University of Cape Town. Um, I was born here in Cape Town in Panorama. My preferred pronouns are her or she and I watched the George interview. Gina? The George Bezos, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Georgina Walter, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm originally from Johannesburg, but I'm now studying at the University of Cape Town. Um, I'm doing a Bachelor of Arts in Theatre and Performing Arts. Um, and I watched the Justice L.B. Sachs video. Thank you, Gina. Um, Nick? Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicholas Kruger, and I am 19 years old. My preferred pronouns are he, they, and I too am at UCT studying uh, my second year in BA Theatre and Performance with a specialization in acting. I was born in Johannesburg, but now for studies, I reside in Cape Town and I watched the Justice Albie Sachs interview. Thank you, Nick. Catherine? Hello, um, my name is Catherine Wood and I'm 19. My pronouns are she, her, and I was originally born in England, but I've lived in South Africa for going on seven years now. Um, I study a BA law degree at the University of Stellenbosch and I'm in second year. Um, and I watched the interview with advocate George Bezos. Thank you, Catherine. And last but not least, Prince. Greetings. Um, I would just like to say thank you to all present here today. Um, my name is Prince David Ibokwe. I'm 20 years of age. I'm a second year student um, studying theatre performance at the University of Cape Town, where I am consistently adapting to the descriptive structural implementations that are associated with performance analysis. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, it's an honor to be here to represent the youth within this economy and just to be given the opportunity to actively engage during the second session of the servant leader and voice my perspective to the spectrum in relation to episode four under the hashtag first time voters. Thank you so much, Prince. I will now um, go to each panelist to ask um, what key issues resonated with them with the interviews that they watched. I'll start with Catherine. Um, well, as a summary, um, the interview that Professor Daniel Plykees did with George Bezos mainly centered around the role that Bezos played in aiding Nelson Mandela in the struggle to achieve democracy. Um, the interview was very informative as it mainly shed a light on the as aspects of Bezos's life that have been less commonly you know, known to most. Um, and he was born in Vasilitsi in Greece, and he came to South Africa during the Second World War as a refugee. Um, and during the interview, it became pretty clear that this actually played quite a large role in why he did what he did. Um, because he, I don't know, it seemed like he really resonated with the other people who felt like out of place in you know, the country that they lived in. Um, so he felt a connection with the people of South Africa who were oppressed and um, 
Yeah, it made him question the authority of the people in power to a large extent. Um, so when he became an advocate, he, he didn't want to join a specific political party, which I found very interesting. Um, and he chose to rather remain independent so that he could, you know, defend kind of anyone from any political party who needed defending, who was being like unfairly discriminated against. Um, and yeah, I just, it was very interesting in the interview, um, Professor Blakey said something along the lines of, you know, given the nature of the brutalities of apartheid, um, did he not think, did um, Advocate Bezos not think that, you know, by helping, you know, people who were oppressed, that he was committing race, class, and professional suicide? And Bezos responded by saying that he didn't think it was suicide. Um, and I don't know, I just found that very interesting because, you know, a lot of people at the time might have thought that it was. Um, but yeah, he also played quite a large role in developing the constitution that we have today, which is quite an amazing piece of legislation. Um, and the focus when it was being developed was that it must protect everyone, you know, regardless of ethnicity or gender or, you know, background, it, it must be a document that protects every South African citizen. Um, but yeah, and he also said how it should be a bridge between the past and the future of South Africa. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a very, very informative interview. Thank you for that, Catherine. I would like to go to Deborah Kahu, who also watched um, George Bezos, Advocate George Bezos' interview and what she thought. Thank you, Lillian. Um, I always say that it's so sad that once someone has passed, it's when we get to know them. Because um, I really, I wasn't really um, well known with, with George Bezos. So, um, but after partaking, deciding to partake in this panel, it gave me like um, the opportunity to learn more about him. And one thing um, that I'd also just like to add to Catherine, um, I also he they all, I also learned that he was also facing oppression in his primary years um, because he questioned the belief of class divisions and their origins. And I think that's what kind of triggered it when he came to South Africa. He was aware that black citizens were denied privilege that he was not. And because of the difference of the color of the skin, he had privilege. And so he decided to rebel against that. Um, another thing that I just like to point out, um, what really reminded me um, is being, being confident in a very uncomfortable setting um, because George constantly, um, it's one of the quotes that was shared on the panel discussion group. Um, let me just find it. Um, I can't find it now, but it speaks about George being very, um, he firmly believes um, that that the truth and the exposing of those who benefit in corruption and the wrongdoing um, is very, very important. Um, I also do believe that the ethical thing is the utmost important and crucial thing. So that's just really something that stood out to me and that I, that I resonated with because you're not supposed to give into the fear, although it's very intimidating. Um, you're supposed to always speak up the truth and be open about it. Um, and I can also sense that he was very, very devoted um, in, in what he did because he was a white man um, and he went against the law. So I know it must have been a big struggle for him. It, it wasn't something that was easy. So um, the discussion, the interview, sorry, it was just very, very interesting and very, um, very, very nice and educating as well. Thank you so much, Deborah. Prince, would you like to add? Yes, yes. Um, 
During the apartheid regime, there were a few advocates that stood out and fought verbally for a transformative um, liberation within South Africa, democratically speaking. And you know, that being said, there is an, an interior of struggle that we as the youth in specific reference to textbook terminologies do not really understand. And, and what I mean by this, I'm talking about the documentation regarding the years of apartheid, where we see legal confrontation um, being actively involved um, during the years of apartheid. And we see um, legal confrontation being actively um, involved between the liberation movement and the apartheid um, regime. And personally, I feel like this should be an important part of that struggle not just of those that were marginalized, but those who, who offered a, a, a helping hand to those that were marginalized. And um, in episode four of The Servant Leader, one of these individuals that um, stood out and who, who, who displayed excellence within intellectual properties and functions um, was late advocate George Bezos, um, who, who, who in the interview, you, you could really grab a sense that he he was a committed fighter in the liberation of South Africa. And what fascinated me was that, like Catherine and Debrika said, that he continued to, to operate within his facility of expertise to fundamentally equip and restore the basic human rights of those that were marginalized. And for me personally, um, for someone who, who, who does not live within South Africa to do that, and put other people before him. Um, I feel like that's quite noble. And you know, further listening to the episode, you can really pick up that he was not just someone who articulated a better deliverance within the governmental operations, but he he, he was someone who was who was big on justice um, with regards to ethical behavioral qualities um, within our government at that time. And you know, therefore, um, and the reason why I say he was big on justice is because he was known to 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 bemoan um, corruption in all its hidden depth of operation um, within the facility of governmental functionalities um, in relation to how the country was governed at that time. And you know, personally, I I I, I do feel that um, late advocate George Bezo stood firmly in the transformation of a better South Africa, particularly for those that were marginalized. And, and how we did this was by tackling the issues that prohibited the excellence within black consciousness, uh, making him a, a profound uh, leader that, con that contributed to the liberation forces within South Africa. Most definitely. Thank you, Prince. And Deborah, I think the quote you were looking for is that George Bezos, Africa George Bezos says, let the people speak. And I think that's very much um, mirrored in what all three of you said. Um, I'll now go to Gina, who watched Aldi Sachs and how she um, and her, what resonated with her when she watched the interview. Thank you, Lydian. Um, so before I had watched this interview, I had heard of Justice L.B. Sachs. Um, my mom had always spoken about him because he was one of her lecturers. Um, she's a lawyer now. Um, but through watching the interview, um, I really resonated with how he described leadership. Um, and I mean, he, the, one of a, a quotes that I have written down here, which really stood out to me. Um, he doesn't see leadership as, as a job. He sees it as a, and I quote here, a kind of expression of life, of idealism, of thought, of language, of rationality, and of hope. Um, and I feel that that's very important um, considering everything that he did. Um, and I suppose it was also very interesting to learn that he played such a huge role that the apartheid government tried to blow up his car and kill him, which I suppose really speaks to 
what a threat they saw him as and the fact that they weren't successful um i think was fantastic because he went on to serve our country and did such a fantastic job and it was really such a privilege watching the video and learning so much thanks thank you Gina, for that Nick, would you like to add Nick, are you able to hear me? Hi, Lydian. I'm sorry about that. Uh, thank you. I would like to add on the LB Sachs interview. Um, to continue from what Georgina was saying, uh, the one thing in particular that stood out for me was just the devotion that LB Sachs gave towards the movement and towards the struggle in the apartheid. And specifically that he as a white man was able to weaponize his privilege that the society afforded him to make it a better place and a better reality for people that same society took away from. And there's something to be, to be learned there um, in, the, in the sense that ones that even though that we did not choose the society that we live in, we have a duty to make it better for other people, for the simple fact that we're all humans living this experience together. Um, and also his devotion to transformation, which didn't end. Uh, when he was appointed constitutional judge, he continued that work that he started all those years ago. In 2005, he and his fellow judges on the constitutional court struck down the Marriage Act of 61, which Prohibit, which prohibited marriage outside of the heterosexual relationship. It said that only men and women are eligible for marriage. He and the court gave parliament one year to rectify that because it was in direct contradiction to what the new constitution of, of the democratic state uh, was that, 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 that was created. And within a year, parliament struck that down and Became, and South Africa became the fifth country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. And just as Albie Sachs was very much pivotal in making that happen, he shows that even after his main goal in life, the end of apartheid came, the end of legal apartheid came in 94. He still continued on his work even afterwards. And it's, 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 for me, it truly is that devotion to transformation, which come, which truly speaks to me. And this notion that transformation doesn't end, that there's no point where we can say we have done everything. There's always more to do. And the last thing is that that speaks to me as the future youth and to many of us as the future youth of South Africa is that our work is very much cut out for us, that we still have much to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, from everybody's um, point, what I took in was that um, both advocate George Bezos and Justice Albi Sachs is that the way that they did it, the way that they described their work is kind of as if they, it was very simple, very easy. Um, they just took it in their stride to be advocates, to be activists for those who did not have a voice. Um, and the way that they describe it was just very simple, very easy. Um, and when you say it's just to not give in to fear. And I think that's something that um, is threaded along through all of the interviews that are on servant, the Servant Leader website, where each um, interviewee says, um, there's no need, there was, we were fearful, but we didn't allow that to, the fear to take us over. We didn't allow it to overpower us because um, that's not what, that was not important at the time. That's not important now for fear to take over. It was just about people, kindness, being um, respectful and just continuously working for those 
who need an extra amplification to their voice and to their problems. Um, now going to the second question, I mean the third question, <laughs> thinking about what kind of leadership South Africa needs and what um, us as the youth of South Africa that Nick touched on, what we can do um, to try and contribute to this, to try and be a mirror of advocate George Bezos and Justice Albi. I'll start with Prince. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lydian. Um, so if you look at leaders like late advocate George Bezos, um, you, you come to understand that social engineering is a more important factor than materialistic factors within society. And what I picked up from him was that he was, he was an individual that, that realized that, you know, life is not about him. Um, it's about the spectrum, the masses and how can he as an individual impact masses, you know? And <clears throat> those are the qualities that, you know, as a, as a young leader in this country that I look out for, you know, within people that, 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 have, the, that, that have the opportunity to, to impact the masses. And if you look at one of the quotes um, on the website, um, quote unquote, don't it fear um, influence you from distinguishing right and wrong. And I do personally feel that, you know, and it took me 19 years to, 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 to understand that, that, to understand this, that life is all about common sense. And what that common sense, it's, it's really a matter of how you are able to discern and decipher between what is right and what is wrong. And, and, and within that context, um, within that framework um, between right and wrong, I mean, there is common sense. So if a leader can, can, can take it in and understand that um, it's not about them, it's about the masses and able to use the common sense to discern what's right and wrong and not, and not behave um, within an, an unethical, um, uh, with like not, not, not behaving in, 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 in an, an, an unethical uh, manner within governmental operations. And I feel like that's what I'm looking out in for future leaders within South Africa, that they are able to use their common sense to just improve the welfare of the citizens within this economy. Thank you. Friends, and I think that's so valid, um, especially for in relation to Sophia De Brain's interview where she mostly pointed out on the importance of compassion. And I think when you say common sense, it's just, the compassion for people, compassion for those who you are serving, and then as well as putting that through into your work and being a true activist for those who need it. Um, Catherine, would you like to add? Thank you, Lydian. Um, there was one part in the interview um, where Professor Plyke said, what drove all of you to take these risks at such a high price, you know, during apartheid? And George Bezos replied by saying, for me, it wasn't a price, it was a duty. And I was acting for people that had courage. Um, so I don't know, that really stood out for me in terms of like what we should be looking for in the people that we want to help move our country forward um, and move past, you know, all the atrocities that have happened. Um, because it, it does take a lot of courage, you know, especially when you look at everything that Advocate Bezos and, and Albie Sachs managed to do and how they just did it, or well, not without thinking, but, you know, they just did it because they felt that they had a duty to do it for the people that couldn't. Um, so, I, yeah, I feel like a big thing to look for is people who will help the voiceless and they don't expect praise or anything. It's just, they want to help people that want to move forward and they feel as though it is their duty to help more than like leading, if that makes sense. Um, and then he also mentioned a quote from Mandela saying, South Africa belongs to the South African living and that also resonated with me to a large extent because that's exactly what all of them tried to give back. Um, the fact that 
people who are marginalized it like their own country didn't belong to them you know and yeah i think that's a lot of what the struggle was about and it hasn't ended and it needs to to carry on and we need to find and look for that in the people who we ask to lead us today you know most definitely thank you catherine and i think um, what a lot of people get confused is that when people, when activists, especially activists, activists from um, apartheid, um, they get confused that oh, it was just so easy, it was just a duty, it's because it was happening. It was such a, it was a regime. It was over the entire country, so they use it as an excuse to not get involved. And I think that it's not about that. It was just a simple human right issue. And they wanted to fight that. And I think that's something that is definitely amplified through both of the interviews that we watched today. Um, Deborah Co, would you like to add? Yes, um, to me, it all comes down to servant leadership, right? And unfortunately, I haven't really encountered that firsthand. I also feel, cause I'm so young, I mean, the time that George Bezos and Nelson Mandela um, they were very active. I was probably not even five years old yet. Um, and it all comes down to um, servant leadership, as I said before. Um, I think it's a very scary thing to acknowledge that we don't really have that in South Africa. Um, I, 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 sometimes I say that we are in a pandemic of our own because we live in a corrupt society, right? And um, that just reflects our current leadership. And I know in my culture as a colored young woman, I remember in my, in, my, in my toddler years, the older generation, not my parents per se, but grandparents, they always tell you, you're supposed to be seen and not to be heard. But I also feel like not just colored women, not just colored men who, who are young. I feel like every young person in South Africa had a different way. It might have not have been in those exact words have heard don't be seen, don't be heard. You're not allowed to use your voice. Um, and as um, George Bezos pointed out, you're supposed to push through the fear, right? And to me, it's, we're not, young people, they're not, they are very smart. They're very intelligent. They're very aware of what's going on around them. Um, and it is very uncomfortable and intimidating and scary because of what's being said from the get-go. But I do believe that we need we need that, that push through, that confidence. Um, we need to be able to speak out. Um, and that's also, that stood out to me, that really resonated, what I resonated with George um, Bezos' interview with. Um, it's, 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 about, it's about speaking out and exposing what we don't want to talk about and that we don't want to expose. And unfortunately, it's about the current leadership today. And I think we can only push to a better leadership if we if we acknowledge what we're dealing with right now. I don't think the intention of leadership was ever for the bad. It was always for the good. Um, and we can only contribute to that if we ourselves become leaders, if we find out what is a good leader really. Um, if we become leaders ourselves, it won't be as hard as a struggle or um, for us to create a a a quality leadership in South Africa. So I'm definitely looking for people who are not afraid to, to speak out, no matter how intimidating it is, because it will always be intimidating and it will always be scary, but it's about people over power. It's not about power over people. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Most definitely. And I think um, with each generation, with each new generation, um, a new, the new generation always notices something different that the older generation didn't notice or didn't see or didn't take care of. And I think that's the power of being a young person is that we're not, we're not as um, shallow as we are perceived to be. We are aware of what's going on. And it's very prominent and it's very evident in our history of South Africa where the people who are known, like in George, advocate George Bezos interview, he said, um, how he was a student. Nelson Mandela was a student. They were students as we are, and they became leaders and they were aware, such as we are aware. 
Um, and it's very prominent in South Africa, especially that our youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. Um, I'd also like to um, say to the audience as well that you can put your questions in the chat room. Um, but to move along, I'd like to go to Nick and hear his insight. Thank you. Thank you, Lydian. Uh, just to add on to what Debra was saying about leaders, leaders who want to lead, that for them leading is, vo is a vocation, like Justice Albi Sachs was saying in an expression of life, not a uh, want of power or want of prestige or anything of the sort. And I think one of the most important things along with wanting to serve people is the idea that one must always speak to power, must always critique power, must always challenge power, because there's no way that you will change or any of us will be able to change anything if we do not speak up and directly say to those in power, listen, you are not doing what we need or we as the future of South Africa need. Um, and then also the challenge must come from a place of genuine concern. It can't come from a place of political uh, maneuvering or angling or anything of that sort, but rather of genuine concern for what is happening. Therefore, if you have genuine concern, you will most likely have a genuine effect one way or the other. So um, to what Justice Albi Sachs was saying about speaking to power, it's that whole idea that leaders now must also be able to take that critique for themselves. And the one moment um, Albi Sachs mentioned specifically is when um, former president, the late Nelson Mandela, was talking about he wanted a voting age of 16, that the children who fought in the struggle should have some say in what is to happen of their country post-94. And although Medieval was incredibly adamant that this should happen, he allowed the Constitutional Committee and those who were put in place to check unilateral decisions like that to say to him, look, this is the standard across the world. This is what the people want. And Medieval was able to take that criticism and say, well, as a servant to struggle to the people, this is what they want, therefore this is what we shall have. And it's that interplay between being able to critique power and having those in power willing to be able to take that critique and do something with it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I'd like to move to Gina. And if Gina could keep in mind the quote from Albie Sachs's interview, being skeptical and not cynical. Thank you, Lydian. Um, so I'd firstly like to say that um, in leadership, I think it's important to remember, and I think what everyone has highlighted is servant leadership, not someone who's looking to better, the, like to make the country thrive, but rather make the individuals of the country thrive. Um, then I'd also like to go on the points that Prince David and Deborah Co made. Um, on especially Prince the having not materialistic factors um, and Debrica with the corruption. I mean, like recently um, there was 13 billion um, in PPE that had to be investigated. Um, and speaking on a pandemic, it's, it's almost as if a, now when there is a huge chance for servant leadership, there was still that not seeing the benefit of the individuals, but rather the benefit of oneself, which is upsetting for me. Um, and then I think going on to the, the quote of Albie Sachs, be skeptical, not cynical. I think that links into what I've just said in that I think that as a country, a country, I think we've almost fallen into the norm of of corruption and just, you know, if money goes missing, we're like, oh, there it goes again, you know, which is not normal. It's not normal for, for money that's supposed to be used for hospitals and roads and masks and, you know, to go missing. And I think it's important to remember that 
we should question our leadership, that it's important to always ask questions. And as youth, I mean, I suppose we don't always have the resources to be in situations of leadership and to make major change, but we do have our voices and our influence. And I think it's so important to always question and hold, um, hold our leadership accountable for what they are doing. Yeah, thank you. Most definitely, thank you, Gina. And thank you to all our panelists. I think when it comes to um, the materialistic factors, when it comes to the money that comes from politics, um, I think it's very much highlighted in Sophia De Brain's interview where she says how people have become so consumed with the image of what it means to be in politics, what it means to be a leader, when in actual fact, it's all about, um, it's all about just serving the people. And again, I forgot which interview it was, but they said how it's so important <laughs> that it's, um, when you go to work in an office, you're going to, it's not your office that you're going to work for. The people are not working for you. You're working for the people and the people that you are working around or the people beneath you in terms of hierarchy of position, they're working with you to work for the people. And I think that's very evident in what means to be a servant leader. Um, from questions from the um, audience, um, our first one is, how will the interviews that you've listened to help you decide for who to vote for in October? Um, I'll start with Nicholas, I liked your expression. <laughs> Thank you, Lydian. Um, that, is a, that is a tough question. Um, so just to go back to what Justice Albie Sachs was talking about, the entire idea of that transformation doesn't end, that one must always have their consciousness and principles in play when thinking about the future of their own country. Um, and just base the basic idea of rule of law, that one cannot make unilateral decisions, that we live in a democracy and require the consent of the people or those the people voted in power to make decisions. So considering all of that, and also looking at the fact that in many ways, the, the structure of apartheid has not ended in South Africa. I mean, Cape Town is a gleaming example of that, that for the most part, people of different racial groups live in different areas. Um, and one only really has to look at a map of Cape Town to understand that. And so to get to actually answer the question, amongst the major parties in South Africa, it's very hard to see who can fit all that criteria. Because although the ANC, the African National Congress, was the leading charge of the struggle along with many other political parties, they have now tainted that reputation with the rampant corruption that has been present in government. And with the Zondo Commission still dragging on, we don't have real clarity of who within the organization is not tainted by that same corruption. Um, moving on to the, the Democratic Alliance, well, they have seemed to have almost made the swing to appeal to conservative white voters, which is never a good sign, so that's no. Um, it's just the decision. I can only imagine that one has to compromise to some extent or the other to see what best, what party can best uh, facilitate what they want for the country and dislodge those in power to make space for that. So voting for the current power structure doesn't help anyone, but voting outside of that in any capacity within um, your own conscious does make that decision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. I would like to then move on to Catherine um, and then also taking in consideration of the first question, which was asked by Leandre Roman was, do you think that our current leaders have lost the element of compassion um, for the people of South Africa. I'll ask Catherine and then I'll ask Prince to further add. Thank you, Lydian. Um, yeah, honestly, 
to think about the fact that we're able to vote now is terrifying um because we get a say in what happens you know with the future of our country it's not a decision to take lightly um it's it's a very very big decision to make and i think the reason it's such a daunting decision is because there are so many qualities that you can look for in a leader um like george bezos was mentioning a few like um, a person who speaks his mind or you know tries not to be judgmental and you know as georgina was saying putting others above yourself you know the needs of others above yourself as a leader and it's very very difficult to find leaders in south africa who do that and it feels like um you know the um the activists of apartheid you know when they came through it feels like any one of them could have been leaders you know like I feel like even if advocate George Bezos was president, you know, things might have gone well. Um, and Nelson Mandela did an amazing job. And, you know, when voting, the people weren't, I feel like they didn't need to struggle to pick, you know, who would do a good job because, you know, they had viable options who fitted the profiles of people who would be good servant leaders, you know? And I, yeah, I feel like it's just difficult in South Africa today to find such good quality leaders. Um, so honestly, as a young person, as much as you want to vote, because you know the impact that it makes, like every vote counts, um, it's very, very difficult. And I'm um, going back to the question about have leaders these days lost their compassion in South Africa. I really think they have when you look at the amount of corruption that's rife in our country. If the leaders cared about the people, then it would be going to the people that need it, you know, especially, you know, as Georgina was saying, in a pandemic, where's the money going? Like, <laughs> it's a global pandemic. And you see other countries, their leaders are you know, helping and they're rolling out vaccines and everything. And then in South Africa, there's, you know, we're all sitting here waiting. And it's just, you can see that the leaders aren't putting the people first. So there's definitely a lack of compassion in leadership in South Africa, without a doubt. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I would like to, before I move on to Prince, I would like to pose a question. Um, how would you say that this then relates to um, are we as the youth and how we've gotten so used to instant gratification through social media? Are we being too um, forward or too, um, we're not being patient enough to see the changes that are happening in South Africa? Um, just a question, Prince. Um, thank you, Lydian. Um, <clears throat> personally, I don't feel, okay, while there is um, a lack of compassion for the people within South Africa, but I, I, I do feel that there's a lack of foundation within the essence of the government in our country. And if, 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 if I had to give an example where there's a lack of foundation, it would definitely be that of the function of money you know, as, as an individual that, that, that enjoys or has the passion for different schematics and methodologies revolving around money and the function of money, it's clear enough that our government do not understand the function of money and with regards to, to just impacting the masses. And I, I, I just personally feel that, um, like I was, speak, I was speaking to Nick um, during our concept scenes that you know, even even if there is a continued cycle of operation from a government, it it won't really make a difference because if the foundation is not structured for 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 the people of, of this country, then 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 what's the point of of a government then, you know, if if the government is not for the people. So I just feel that um 
essentially when it comes to me voting as an individual, I I do I I do want to see a not a break of that cycle because it, it just wouldn't change, but a stronger implementation within the foundation of the government and, and how they are able to, to understand the function of money and how that function is able to generate to generate generational wealth for everyone in this country. I mean, there's, there's a turnover of $5 trillion in the financial markets. And, and you know, what is 1 million? I mean, it's, a, it's an atom, you know? So I feel like there, there, is, there is enough for everyone to eat. But I just feel that um, when, when, when we have individuals that are in control of the function of money, is that they don't understand how to use it and how to implement it so that there is enough for everyone and where there isn't any uh, like unethical um, behavior within government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prince Georgina. Would you like to add? I would like to add, thank you. Um, so on the question of, of compassion, um, I'd first like to say, I, I don't think that Okay, so I'm going to start by saying I think that the narrative that has been that has started to be told is that our government officials have lost compassion for the citizens of South Africa. But I do understand that is that is not for every um, politician and government official. Um, but I want to speak on more of what I was saying earlier about um, pandemic and. Um, and the PPE corruption during the pandemic. Um, so I suppose, you know, during the pandemic, when we were told to wash our hands regularly, to sanitize and to wear a mask, um, that that was very great advice and it worked, it worked. But I think there was almost a, a blurred vision towards South Africa um, in that, there's a large majority of our country who get paid under minimum wage, who, I mean, in townships didn't even know what hand sanitizer was. Um, and now you're telling, um, you're telling people to, to buy it, who maybe can't afford it, who can't afford a mask, maybe don't have running water in the area. But because of the past and maybe neglectful leadership, there, there is no running water and in situations like this, how is a person supposed to fight COVID if they can't even, you know, they can't wash their hands, they can't do what the government is telling them to do. Um, which I suppose is in a sense, a lack of compassion, of hearing the voices of understanding, because I mean, so often and say Cape Town, for example, people being kicked out of their houses, um, evicted, and thrown onto the street, um, people living on the street treated so poorly without proper foundation. And I think, I suppose there is still a compassion for the wealthy in the country who can use their money to have a voice, but for the voiceless who can't pay to have a voice, I suppose there is a lack of compassion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. Nicholas, would you like to answer my question? My question was in terms of instant gratification that our um, generation are so used to, does this make us less impatient to the ch for change to actually occur within our country? Uh, thank you, Lydian. I don't understand why, why patience, because Patience has often been used by the status quo, by those in power to gaslight those who want to change something. It's always be patient, change will come, but change has not come. Change is happening so slowly, or it isn't even happening, just as Regina has been highlighting. That, um, and also what Prince David has been highlighting in the sense that there is this concentration of wealth that is not being distributed, that is not being allowed to be shared with the majority of South Africans. So to cite a specific example, the Western Cape government demolished a LGBTQ refuge in OBS recently. 
They threw the people out, all of their belongings onto the street. They have nowhere to go. They have no money. Their families either abandoned them because they're queer or don't care about them or for the most part see them as less than alive. So how could you talk patience to them? How could you say, oh no, be patient, change will come when their entire lives have been waiting for change to come. I mean, as much as we were promised a bright future and as much as certain aspects of that promise have been fulfilled, like the right to vote, the opportunity to become, to receive the same things other South Africans have been receiving. The question then becomes, to what extent is that even true that we, have received those promises that um, the majority of South Africans do not have the same sort of access that those in front of me or that those who go to UCT have. I mean, the people that go to UCT are select few compared to everybody else in the country. Not everybody has that opportunity, not for want of their own, but because they still continuously deny that opportunity. And it isn't a matter of pull up your socks, work harder. It's the fact that there are structures that are still in place from over a hundred years ago, even more that have been there in the foundation of this country that have not been uprooted. So my question is why patience when we have been patient, yet we don't see that effect of patience. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Catherine and then Gina. Thank you, Lydian. Um, yeah, as Nicholas was saying, um, there was a case that um, Advocate Fizos mentioned, the Khurbom case, and it, it was very similar. The government like destroyed the informal settlement, you know, and it destroyed the houses of many, many people. And Mrs. Khurbom took you know, the case to court saying, we don't have anywhere to live now. Um, and the government was like, no, 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 we have, we have a book, you know, this thick on like housing rules. And the judge just said, okay, well, show me the page that tells Mrs. Khrudbom where her and her family are gonna live tonight. And, you know, in that book that thick, they couldn't find that page because it didn't exist. Um, and this happened, you know, a while ago. And like with Nicholas' example, it, example, it's happening today. So you can say that like, we have been waiting, we have been patient, you know? And people telling us to be patient now, <laughs> it didn't get us anywhere in the last 20 or so years. So what's patience gonna change? Um, it just feels like the past is repeating itself, so it's like not enough has been done and patience isn't gonna do anything at this point. You can only be so patient when so little has changed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Vivian. Um, so I think in terms of instant gratification and social media, that social media so strongly um, highlights everything. I mean, it is so easy to, to pick apart every single aspect of something on social media because it's such a huge platform. And there can be such strong backing on all of those sides because maybe each, each aspect resonates with certain individuals. Um, and I think, I agree that change has been slow, but um, I suppose you can't change everything at once. Change has to be made through, and we don't see we don't see the the, the background of it, all the all the um, the laws and regulations and everything that has to be made before change can happen. But I do agree with what Catherine and Nicholas were saying. Um, in that there's been very little thought on what happens after uh, people have followed the law of, of, of evictions um, and et cetera, et cetera. 
Thank you. Thank you, Gina. I would like to then move to the third question posted on the Facebook um, that's, um, that we are live on. The question is, should they call for General Vary's suspension for expressing his opinion on his social media platform? Does he have the right to express his um, enrichment with our constitution? Um, I would like to move to Deborah Kerr to answer this question. Sorry, Vivian. Um, please just repeat that question. I can't find it in the chat. The question One is, is to it. For General Vary's suspension for expressing his, his opinion on his social media platform. General Vary is, a head, is the head of police of the Western Cape who was put on suspension because he posted social media reports about police corruption. Um, this morning, me and my father spoke about Helen Zilla, who was in a similar situation. Um, not quite similar, but it, it kind of links with one another. Um, he's obviously speaking the truth, right? He's, he's exposing something that happened. Um, and I feel that in him doing that, he's the one being crucified. I also, I, it's, it's so clear and evident that it's not about, because I wrote here in my notes, um, um, the, the biggest goal in, in South Africa today for me, I feel in the, in the authority is not the well-being in all aspects of the citizens of South Africa, right? Um, it's about power and its benefits. And once you expose that, all the ugly and the dirty and the corruption, just as, let me just check his name again, um, Viri, I apologize if that's not his name, um, once you get a situation like that or someone like that that exposes that, that takes the, the possibility of him, that takes that power away in a way because now that person is being exposed, if you get what I'm saying. So that means that that person has the possibility of not having that power anymore, of not having that authority anymore and all the benefits that comes along with it. Because let's face it, we've spoken about it before, um, compassion, there's none of that anymore. It's not about the citizens of South Africa. And Prince also mentioned it. Why is there a government then? Um, I just, I honestly, I just think that speaking the truth is a dangerous thing to do today. Um, if you are going at um, the, the wrongdoings. Um, so to answer the question, um, let me just check it again, because I think I went off from my point. Um, so I'm just looking for it. Can you just ask the question again, please? Um, or do you, did you just want me to add on that? Yes, I just want, wanted you to add on that. Thank you for that response. That was OK. Fun. Um, I would then like to close with the last question, and this is for all our panelists. Um, the question is, are individual leaders not impacted by political systems and societies? Can we speak of servant leadership outside of its con social societal con context? Sorry. Um, and I think this goes, the spearheads to our creators and our actors in the panel. Um, as well as Catherine, to add on this. Um, <laughs> uh, can I start with Prince, please? Also in relation to General Verity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, guys. Um, if I had to dissect the terminologies regarding the term individual, um, it is that of a human as an indivisible um, duality who has spirit and matter. And, and with that being said, you know, this essence, you know, and I feel that as an individual that is politically exposed, you, you don't have to find inspiration from political systems or societies. You know, you as an individual, you are your own society. You know, you are your own customs, you are your own tradition. You know, and I, I do feel that, you know, as individuals, we are placed on this earth to, to, to create nothing to something something meaningful where we can, you know, just impact the masses. And, you know, that's what I'm learning um, at, at my course, you know, um, how, how to create nothing into something meaningful. 
And I, I do feel that as an individual leader, you, 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 you shouldn't just be impacted by political systems and societies. You know, um, what about, you know, other in, like, what about other, other, other sections where you can draw in, inspiration from? Like for one, for example, like me, you know, as, a, as an inspiring entrepreneur, I'm not just looking at the creative facility, but expanding my horizons in terms of what I can do in terms of my, my fi financial understanding that, that, that I've, I've come to develop in terms of what I've taken in, in terms of knowledge, of course. So I feel that like, it, one, you should not just draw um, inspiration from political systems and societies, but draw from what can impact you as an individual um, of intellectual property and function. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. And to close, I'd just like to reiterate again um, from what we've said throughout this panel discussion, the power of compassion, the power of compassion through common sense um, and how this can create a true servant leader. Um, and in terms of the question, I think that that is most important because yes, you can be a servant leader in all parts of life. It doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be governmental. Um, and so in order to be that, in order to be a true servant leadership, a true servant leader in all parts of society, you must then be compassionate and fight for those who need for more voices to fight for their cause and to not to overshadow them, to not take their mic, but to add a speaker. Um, yeah. I think that's most important. Would anybody like to add before we close this all? Ibra. And I would just like to answer the question I got from Facebook. I'm gonna put it very simple and short. Um, if they they will they will fail him in his human rights, in his right to express himself, if they do decide to suspend him. Um, one thing I do notice it was like that with the apartheid era and also now, um, you cannot speak the truth because you will be affected by it and it won't be for your benefit. So that's definitely something that's still happening in South Africa. I think Nicholas mentioned it, that there's still an apartheid structure happening. And I also do feel why create a constitution if when the citizens of South Africa use it and embrace it and then you you um you punish them for doing so so that's just something i'm thinking of right now that i'd like to point out most definitely and thank you so much deborah Kerr, for clearing up your answer to the question um i'd just like to also say thank you so much to our panelists to the audience who joined us for this discussion um, I'd also like to reiterate and make sure that everybody follows us on the Servant Leader social media sites um, and to continue to engage with us on Servant Leadership website um, at www.danielpifus.com. Um, yes, thank you so much for joining us.